Well, I guess it was closer than we expected. But at the same time, the New York Giants lost. Welcome back to the Big Blue in the Bronx podcast, everyone. Please hit that like button, comment, and subscribe. Turn on post notifications so you know when a live stream pops or a video drops. Also, five stars on Apple Podcasts for Twinville and Big Blue in the Bronx. Appreciate y'all uh, coming out and, uh, you know, listening, watching, doing whatever you're doing. Just supporting as well. Um, so the New York Giants lost 28-20. to It was really a 28-13 uh, kind of a game. And a lot of people have come out and criticized coaching. Also, shout-outs to uh, Donald from Boys and Big Apple and Rob from Learning Out Sports. We actually got together, um, not uh, in person, but virtually on StreamYard for three hours and rewatched the game. Um, you know, after the loss, I was, like, kind of down because, hey, listen, you're not supposed to be happy about your team losing. So, um, around nine o'clock and obviously Donald lives in Scotland. So I had to make sure it was good with him first. I'm like, you know what? I ain't got shit to do. Why don't we re- re- go out and rewatch the game? So we, we did that for, you know, a few hours. Um, I must say, I really, how do I put this delicately? I guess it confirmed all the suspicions I had. Like, there was nothing that changed my mind that I didn't already, you know, see uh, when I was watching the game live and all that stuff. But shout-outs to them. They had a really good stream, uh, like over 800 views on Nerding Out Sports. Please go subscribe. Uh, The link is in the description, whether you're on a podcast platform or you're on a uh, YouTube platform. But everybody's coming out and criticizing the coaching staff. You guys know that I have been very, very low on Mike Kafka the last few weeks. And you guys know I was low on Dable last week because of the fact of the Adoree Jackson thing, some time management stuff, whatever. I honestly don't think that the coaching staff deserves as much criticism as they're getting. Um, and this is the first time I'm coming out and saying something like this and having that sort of unpopular opinion take, whatever. Um, I think it's a talent issue. I think it's a roster issue. I think it's an execution issue. All those three, I think, go over the fact um, that everybody's blaming the coaching. I think those three outweigh the one um, because they can't do anything in the passing game. It's obviously, you know, in front of us. In terms of the running game, I mean, they probably put out some good run fits. But at the same time, you know, when Jalen Smith and Jalen Smith, to some people, had a nice game, I looked back. On the uh, replay of the game, and you know, sometimes he was just getting blown up by offensive linemen. He was getting blown up by, uh, you know, running backs and tight ends that were really uh, blocking him. So, you know, he he's a, he's an average Mike linebacker, and you know, if we had a better linebacker situation, I don't think he would be starting. Um, Tay Crowder played a little bit, wasn't really much of an impact, and Michael McFadden. I mean, you know, he's solid in coverage he's solid when rushing the passer probably had you know one or two pressures but he's not a run stuffing um you know linebacker he's more of that out in space off ball type guy and it's good that we have him but at the same time when you don't have guys that can disengage blocks sometimes you have to move around pieces and see what happens but overall, before we go into the stats and all this other stuff, I just don't think that coaching until like the second half was a big issue. Um, I think it was mostly the fact that we were undermanned. We were so under talented in certain areas. And even, you know, if we got a Dory Jackson into this game, the offense didn't execute. Uh, I just think talent was an issue. And talent really has been an issue, obviously, the whole season. Sometimes you could coach over it, sometimes you coach above it. Um, but even like in the first game, we remained heavily close with the Cowboys and we still just acknowledge that uh you know the talent is an issue got my Rangers cup um even though I'm I'm a casual Rangers fan uh it's more easier than just opening up a water bottle and doing it every time so let's get right into it um we're gonna go with the team stats first actually no not team stats we'll go with the player stats Defense, then team stats. So Daniel Jones was 21 to 35, 228 yards, 6.5 yards per throw. 
Uh, one touchdown, three sacks taken, a passer rating of 88.7 and a QBR 61.3. Dak Prescott, 21 of 30, 261 yards, 8.7 yards per throw, two picks, two touchdowns, 71.7 QBR to go along with 91.1 passer rating. Saquon Barkley had a poor day on the ground, 11 carries, 39 yards, one touchdown. Gary Brightwell, five carries, 31 yards. Daniel Jones, three carries, 14 yards. And Matt Burita, three carries, uh, excuse me, two carries for six yards. Um, and then Dallas rushing game, Ezekiel Elliott just destroyed us again. Um, surprised it really wasn't Pollard too much. I mean, Pollard had some nice gains, but overall he had 3.3 yards per carry. Elliott, once again, you know, did the bigger damage against us, uh, 92 Yards on 16 carries, 5.8 yards per carry. A touchdown. Peyton Hendershot had a two-yard rushing touchdown. Dak Prescott rushed twice for four yards. Um, C.D. Lamb also had two rushes for 11 yards. One went for uh, 12, which was the uh, first down. Uh, I think it was the first play of Dallas's first drive, actually. Um, you look at the receiving game. Darius Slayton, three receptions, 63 yards. Obviously, that 44-yard bomb down the field was excellent. Great catch by Slayton. Great throw by Jones. Uh, Richie James, five receptions, 41 yards. Isaiah Hodgins, three receptions, 31 yards. Chris Myrick, a reception for 23 yards. I like that play from Daniel Jones, I must say. Um, I mean, I'll kind of criticize him later on, but there was a play where he was just standing in there. You know, Jaron Curse really should have hit him um, because that would have turned it into, you know, an incomplete pass or a turnover. But you had Richie James, like, right in front of him. He rolled out. Richie James was in front of him, and Myrick was just – Flowing his way up the field, he throws it to Myrick. That's a 23-yard gain. So shots Daniel Jones and Chris Myrick for the connection on that one. They got to use him more. Um, you know, I, Cager had a good play this game. Tanner Hudson really never got involved. Um, Brightwell had two receptions. Barkley had four receptions, and you know, not much else in the passing game. But um, as far as the uh, Dallas receiving game goes. Uh, they spread the ball out, not as much as the Giants did, though. C.D. Lamb had six receptions for 106 yards. Uh, Michael Gallup, five for 63. Ferguson, three for 57. Dalton Schultz had both touchdowns in the passing game, four for 31. Zeke Elliott and Pollard, they got three receptions, uh, four yards combined. Fumbles, well, both quarterbacks fumbled once and recovered it. Daniel Jones was running on a play, and he actually had the ball loose, but he recovered it. And then Dak Prescott on that fumble um, that allowed Dalton Schultz to, uh, you know, move up the field off a of Pinnock broken tackle. Um, wasn't very happy with Jason Pinnock in this game, I must say, in extended snaps, and that kind of obviously shows some of these guys, right, that we put on the field. They really don't deserve starter snaps, but obviously – um, when you're down your starters, you have to do what's best. Uh, Jalen Smith, him and Julian Love had 10 tackles. Both of them had a tackle for a loss. Julian Love obviously had the pick as well. Um, as far as quarterback hits go, the Giants had nine quarterback hits, and they had no sacks, which I'm very unhappy about. Uh, six tackles for a loss. Michael McFadden had two tackles for a loss. Leonard Williams, two tackles for a loss. He really started getting in probably later in the game. Um, but also stats-wise, you know, you can't see some of the pressure he was putting on from the interior. Uh, he's had a solid year. I mean, not much on the stat sheet, though. Um, nine quarterback hits, as I said. Kayvon Tibbs, we'll talk about him, uh, was a big factor. Five quarterback hits. O'Shane Zimenez, Jihad Ward, one quarterback hit each. Um, Dexter Lawrence had one, and Leonard Williams had one as well. Take a look at the Dallas side. They didn't have as many QB hits as we did, but they did have more sacks. Uh, Micah Parsons came in for two sacks off Andrew Thomas, and Dorrance Armstrong came in for one sack on Jack Anderson. There was a stunt twist up the middle, and uh, Anderson couldn't find his guy. Really struggled uh, in the game against the Cowboys. Four tackles for loss, two of them attributed to Parsons, one to Chauncey Golston and Dorrance Armstrong. Um... Take a look at the quarterback hits, two for Parsons, one for Donovan Wilson, two for Dorrance Armstrong, two for Demarcus Lawrence. Uh, Lawrence really didn't have too much of an effect on the game as I thought he would, but obviously all that really channeled to Dorrance Armstrong, who I really previewed as, okay, listen, they got Demarcus Lawrence, they got Micah Parsons, but Dorrance Armstrong is going to be a factor as well. So Radarius Williams also had an interception, uh, two turnovers for the Giants, didn't really do anything with a combined three points off of that. Um, Matchup-wise and team stats, they had 26 first downs. Giants had 21. They had 13 passing first downs. Giants had 11. 
Uh, 10 rushing first downs for the Cowboys, 6 for the Giants. Four first downs from penalties, three from the Cowboys, three for 11 third down efficiency for the Giants, which isn't good, and they're usually at least solid on third down. Uh, The Cowboys' offense was just trashing our third down defense, whether it was long or short. Uh, Seven for 11. That's incredible. Uh, Giants were 0 for 2 on fourth down. They were 0 for 1. They ran 10 more plays. They ran 69, and we ran 59 total yards. They had 430. We had 300. Both teams had 10 drives. Uh, yards per play they had 6.2 giants had 5.1 red zone the giants red zone defense was pretty awful has been the last two weeks four for four uh the giants were two for three penalties they had 13 penalties for 86 yards and uh the giants had seven penalties for 66 yards and you know before we go to the turnovers and time possession you know people say ah well you know dallas got more penalties so that's good but at the same time it's how you rebound it's not just the context of those penalties. It's not it's just not uh, – I can't talk today. Um, it's not just where they happen and what part of the drive. It's how you rebound from them. And the Giants were never able to rebound from these penalties. I mean, that second drive where Isaiah Hodgins went in for the touchdown, the illegal man downfield and all these different things, then you have the illegal shift and Jones throws it away. That's intentional grounding. So um, that wasn't really a, a responsible decision by Daniel Jones. Um, I thought he – Thought it was a dead play, but illegal shift isn't a dead play. Um, I know sometimes it could get mixed up with you know neutral zone infraction and offsides and false start, um, but he has to be a little bit smarter on that play. Know what's going on. Uh, two turnovers, obviously for the Cowboys that went in the Giants' hands and do anything with it. And then thirty four oh nine to twenty five fifty one. That was the time of possession. So let's go into the key takeaways first. First offensively, of course. So, I thought that Daniel Jones had an average game. Um, this was not that one, not one that really should thread the needle for anybody going on either side. Um, and I know that you really should stay away from Twitter talk on a podcast. But, obviously, Twitter's Twitter. Um, and, obviously, you have to incorporate the fan base that's not on Twitter. But, in my personal opinion, this game really shouldn't move the needle for anybody. Um, whether you're a Daniel Jones uh, supporter or Homer or your, uh, you know, Daniel Jones pessimist, whatever. I just don't think that this moves a needle for anybody. He had some good throws. He had some bad throws. Um, it was an average game. It was an average game. Like the throw to Cager, you know, the throw to Myrick, he improvised through throws it, you know, Myrick's flowing up field, uh, the throw to Slayton. He also had another throw to Slayton, but Slayton stumbled. Then you look at the infamous fourth down. Um, at the time, instant reaction, I thought it was Barkley's fault. There is a part where you do wish that Barkley hauls that in, but that's on Daniel Jones. And, you know, I've talked about the inconsistencies with him a little bit, but he had pressure in his face when he threw that ball to Darius Slayton downfield. He did. Glowinski got blown up. Glowinski's not good. I'm going to say it right now. We'll talk about him and, and some of the other guys in a little bit. But uh, he had pressure in his face. Jones just heaved it up. And, you know, that's that. But also, he was facing some pressure on some of these bootlegs. It's all some of these other different plays. Um, And that was one play, the fourth down. Throw it a little bit more in front of him so he could haul it in. You know, Saquon's already tripping as is. Um, I thought Saquon also didn't have a good game. And I think there's concerns really going towards injury, towards efficiency, and if you want to look big picture. Now, obviously, reverting a little back to the Daniel Jones stuff and I'm going to talk about big picture with something else in a minute but um the only way in my personal opinion that you can get the idea of okay I'm moving the needle and saying Daniel Jones should not be here next year I think is because of win total and everybody said coming in the year well you know uh Daniel Jones right he uh he needs to get us the playoffs and that window is closing very slowly I'm gonna admit it um you know, obviously, I was a big hype artist when we started getting some really good wins against some good teams and some bad teams. Um, but that window is closing because Washington can very well beat the Falcons. Um, you know, the Eagles, I forget what they play this week. They play Green Bay. Green Bay is not very good. Um, and then Dallas obviously beat us, so they have the tiebreaker over us. And, you know, what also kicks us in the ass, which people forget about, is this. 
let's just say we beat Washington the first time, right? The second time, if we lose, they get the tiebreaker. That's what happened in 2020 when we beat the Cowboys the second time around. We got the tiebreaker, or else none of that speculation starts going on about us winning the division and the Eagles tanking that game, whatever. Um, but that window is closing. That's why people are, you know, whether you want to consider it rational or not, they're trying to say, okay, Daniel Jones needs a fresh start or we need a fresh start. We, we can't have him next year. So I, I'm not going to go too much into my thoughts about that. I'm just kind of emulating and transferring information to you guys, maybe that aren't on Twitter. So there's that. Um, obviously talk about Saquon not looking good. Rushing game, not very efficient. Once again, um, I think, and I'm really starting to get this in my head, that 35-yard carry game really, really, really damaged Saquon for a few reasons. We all know a few weeks ago, probably even a month ago, uh, there was this speculation about Saquon having a shoulder injury. I believe it was after the Bears game or after the Green Bay game. They said he was fine, whatever. And he really hasn't shown up on the injury report either. So that tells us, okay, is he injured or is he not injured? Shoulder, obviously, was the injury. Um, so there's that. I started calling out on Boys in the Big Apple a little bit, um, even though nobody really picked up on it. I just didn't think that Saquon was a very good runner against Seattle. Um, were there holes to open up? Absolutely not, because we could not get the running game started, and we were down constantly, so we had to keep passing the football and throwing it, but our receivers weren't getting open, and Daniel Jones really wasn't efficient again. Uh, it was kind of a step-back game, kind of like this was, um, but also it could be another game, once again, where it really doesn't move the needle for anybody on either side. Um, but I started calling out, well, Saquon was a bit of a dancer in this game. I was talking about the Seahawks game. Then you move two weeks later. It's not really as efficient. They just keep grinding the run. And, you know, it's not like teams are going to sit here and allow seven yards per carry every run. You're not going to get that from a running back every single time, every single run. It's just not going to happen. Um, that's why sometimes you look at games from the stat sheet of the film, the running backs get like 17 carries, but they have a couple of explosive plays. You double that, 35 carries for Saquon Barkley, and there really wasn't too many explosive running plays. And you also got to factor in how much that actually equals on a touchdown drive. Like, um, Daniel Jones was pretty good on the touchdown drives against the Texans, right? You combine that, you have Barkley, 15 carries, 54 yards. That's under four yards per carry, um, which isn't very good. But it just shows you they were trying to pound the run. They were trying to pound the rock, right? And, you know, obviously... They're recognizing either that he's hurt or not efficient because they're using Brightwell in uh, a mixture of different things. They're using Matt Breida a little bit more than they probably anticipated. So I think what we need to come to the realization is this, before we even go into big picture shit, is that Saquon Barkley is not a cowbell back. He is not. You cannot rely on him. For 25, 30 carries a game. I know that people will say, uh, that's bullshit. No, it's not bullshit. You need to keep it at 20 at most. Um, and I get it. Listen, right off the top of everybody's head is the narrative that, you know, Saquon Barkley is the offense. He is what makes this offense go. Um, he is the gas for the car that is our offense. But at the same time, you have to, you have to find ways in your offensive game plan to move from it because you can automatically assume, well, you know, they don't respect us in the passing game, so we're just going to go to the running game. But they will respect that. They will respect that. And you know what? Based off the point I just made, teams are stacking the box more, showing that they don't respect our receivers. So you get them a little bit more involved. And what I'll say is this. I don't think Mike Kafka had a terrible play calling game until we hit the fourth quarter. And I also liked how they went away from the run. They really never tried it until late in the game, which is bad, but good at the same instance because, you know, good in the beginning, you didn't really waste any time, but bad because it's the question why the fuck are you running the ball? in the fourth quarter with five minutes left. And it's just getting to me these last few weeks where there's no urgency on certain things, right? Last week, um, before halftime, there was just bullshit before halftime. There was Daniel Jones, Brian Dable, whoever the fuck it was. And I'm going to be honest with you, I'll tell you guys the truth. 
I didn't watch the last drive of the half uh, for the Giants against the Lions because after the touchdown, my work tablet cut out. It's not like I threw it up against a wall or did this or did that. It cut out because it had to update. Um, so there's that. I didn't watch the drive before the half, but I was told by somebody it just wasn't good in terms of management. Um, what I also would like to know before we go back to my Kafka is, um, does Daniel Jones have the freedom to keep these? Dallas isn't very good against running quarterbacks. You see that on the stat sheet, Justin Fields. Now, they can make people miss. Daniel Jones is not really known for that type. He is more of the cowbell type. Obviously, you're not running him 100 times a game um, because that would get him hurt. No doubt about that. But here's the thing. He could have kept it a couple of times. And that's where me, Donald, and Rob wonder, wait a minute. Can he actually keep these? Or are they telling him, you just got to hand it off? Because there are some open holes. If, you know, either he needs to make better reads or he just needs to say, look, I can keep some of this. So that's also my problem with Daniel Jones is not that it's a tough, it's a tough way to put it in words. How's that? Because I would like him to go off the playbook a little bit more, like stay away from it in a way. And use his head a little bit more. Like there was, I think, against the Texans game. Look, if you see a play, let it rip, right? Uh, that's what Brian Dable said. But I think that analogy really needs to apply into some of these run plays as well. Look, if you see that the defensive end is not playing honest and he's going for Saquon from the blind side. Well, it's actually, no, not the blind side, but the back side. You can keep it and run. Daniel Jones had several opportunities. And you may get those opportunities against Washington. You very well could. So I need to know. Maybe the reporters ought to ask this. And they've done a fair job of asking the tough questions. You know, does Daniel Jones have the freedom to keep the football? Or does he not? Because we need to get that figured out. Because if you let him, and this is this, this is a whole big picture shit right here. That's just a, a small sell in the body of the problems that you know the Giants offense is having is trusting Daniel Jones and if you can't trust him on a pass play how does it make sense you trust him on a run play the ability yes but the trust factor in big picture just doesn't make a ton of sense and once again Darius Slayton three receptions now, there were times, obviously, he could have been locked up by Trayvon Diggs or Anthony Brown. But can't you give him the ball a little bit more? And once again, they passed 35 times, right? And they were stuck in that situation. But all goes back to what I said a few weeks ago. They should have taken advantage against the Texans, and they should have taken advantage at certain times against the Lions because they started out run, didn't work, And then they were all of a sudden down, what was it, nine points? Something like that against the uh, the Lions. So, I mean, it's going to have to get cleaned up. Whether you're talking playoffs, whether you're talking about this, that, and the other thing, it has to get cleaned up because we're facing some pretty good defenses down the stretch. The Colts defense, I think, is one of the top in the league. Though people look at them and say, ah, Jeff Saturday's coaching them. No. No, I'm not looking at them like that. And, um... Yeah, so that's pretty much what I have to say on that. But Saquon, obviously, I'm not going to go into too many big picture things. He just doesn't look good right now. Whether it's efficiency, his shoulder, um, I don't know how it affects speed, but he's he's not confident right now. And I think that needs to be fixed because um, there is one point where you like him to carry the offense a little bit. And, you know, at the same time, you don't really want him to be overused. And overutilized. There's that. Um, I think they used him as receiver like twice, three times in the game, which is not something I'm fairly happy about. But at the same time, Daniel Jones missed him once or twice. So I can't say I'm surprised about that. Um, let's move to, you know, the O-line, the receiver room. Darius Slayton was the best receiver. He was the lead receiver. And then 
I think Nick Gates was the best O-lineman on the field before even PFF scores and all that bullshit came out. Um, Nick Gates was the best O-lineman on the field, and he should continue to start at center. Uh, if they bring in back Feliciano, I, I think they're doing themselves, themselves so much damage. Um, you know, we'll see what happens when Bredesen comes back, if they're going to bench a Zudu, which I have a feeling they could based on how they did it with Shane Lemieux, but I I have no crystal ball in my fucking hand, so I can't tell. But Nick Gates should be the starting center moving forward. Andrew Thomas had his worst game, and I think it's, you know, you're due for a bad game. He played bad. This is, you know, you could say that, but at the same time, you could say, okay, uh, he's one of the better tackles in the NFL, and guess what? He is entitled to a bad game. Michael Parsons was sick the first time they played, and we saw how Thomas dominated him. Well, guess what? Roles were reversed in this game, and Michael Parsons dominated him. So, yeah, it's an even Steven sort of keel. Micah Parsons, still one of the best uh, players in the NFL overall. Andrew Thomas, one of the best tackles in the NFL. And I think he still should deserve a Pro Bowl despite the game he had. Uh, as for Tyree Phillips, I don't think he played that well. Nothing spectacular, allowed a couple of pressures. And our interior, outside of Nick Gates, is not very good. Um, you know, obviously we've had some plug and play left guard all season, Lemieux, Bredesen, Azudu, and Anderson. Anderson wasn't good. He didn't know how to handle a stunt. Uh, he, at times, I mean, he's just, I don't know what's going on with him. I think there's a lot of mental errors there as well. Um, and it's part of getting in tune with the offense. Uh, this has been really going on since Seattle where he's come in the game, false starts, all this other stuff. So, um, hopefully he does not get the start against Washington. I would look for a Zudu maybe to get the start. Um, and the other guy I haven't been talking about is Mark Lewinsky. He is not very good. Um, and even in the running game, we were watching and he's getting blown up. He's missing blocks. He missed a block on Damone Clark on the touchdown. Damone Clark just shoved him off of him. Now Saquon obviously bullied his way into the end zone, but this is a guy who's supposed to be a good run blocker and we were you know talking uh doing our study and rob's like how much do you think it would cost to cut glowinski next year and we looked at it you're saving next to one million but eight million in dead cap so you know obviously they meant for that contract to be two out of three years in usage but the thing is do you see do you possibly look at um, putting Bredesen in there at right guard. Because I think a lot of Glowinski's play could be caused by Feliciano and having, you know, inconsistency on the other side. But he's a veteran. I mean, he should know the length of the law at this point. Um, but that's pretty much what I have to say about the offense. And I know I've been going on a tangent for a little while. Um, let's talk about the defense. I'm not very happy about the no sacks part. They did have some really good pressure. Um, and it all starts with Kayvon Thibodeau. He needed this game. Um, really badly, really badly in terms of expectations from the rookie. Um, he really wasn't getting there in the last few weeks and, you know, he is getting held and I get that, but sometimes you have to uh, do certain things and really make an impact on the game. You know, um, if you're getting held, you know, once you go up against a tight end, blast them, blast the tight end. Um, and that's what he did a couple of times to Dalton Schultz. There was just one play. I think it was in garbage time, but it still counts on the stat sheet and it still counts overall as he was literally mowing him back in the backfield and Elliott's hit or was Pollard actually, maybe, uh, one of the running backs was hit and then caused a tackle for a loss. That's what, you know, being a teammate is it's putting yourself in the position so your teammates can make plays, not just you. Um, Thibodeau, once again, he was dominating off that left side against Tyler Smith. He was getting in there he was just getting in there as well they were also rushing him from the middle linebacker spot not that he was in coverage or anything but he was uh he, yeah yeah he needed this game he needed this game overall and i think honestly if you want my honest opinion my honest opinion do what some of these nfl teams do what do some of these nfl teams do alex start putting them on the right side i know obviously it seems that his niche is on the left side. Start putting him up against right tackles, which would be the defensive left. Start putting him up against the right tackle. Now, Charles Leno is a solid tackle. It's not like he's one of the better ones in the league. He's, you know, an average guy, above average. But Sam Cosme, 
At least that I know. Maybe this is me just being a casual. It's not like he's a world beater. You can defeat Sam Cosme. Aziz Ojolari did that, and it would really fucking help if Aziz Ojolari were to come back against Washington. Um, not that he probably is like fully healthy or fully Aziz or anything. I mean, obviously he made his impact against the Bears with that forced fumble, but that would help Thibodeau out a lot. Obviously drawing attention more towards Aziz or more towards Thibodeau or, you know, vice versa, just getting those guys involved and you would actually be able to rush four, which is really the dream of Giants fans the last 10 years. Um, but start putting him on the defensive left. Start putting him up against these right tackles. Philly's going to be a tough one. Um, I don't know how long Darasaw is supposed to be out, so you could probably maybe put him on the left side against the Vikings. And I'm not trying to say always take the easy way out because that's just not going to work in the NFL. Uh, you have to go up against like good left tackles. You have to go up against right tackles. You have to go up against some of these other guys as well. Um, but try to get more production where you see fit. Just my thing on that. Uh, but Kayvon, shots to him. He dominated the left side probably without considering Radarius Williams. I would say the best player on the defense uh, off the Cowboys game. Run defense is still porous. Uh, I'm going to go right into that. It's just a f- matter of linebackers and us getting blown up. Um, you know, we never really stack the box. And it's just a way of the flow and the balance of this defensive setup where, you know, you can't stack the box because you have to respect the receivers and you don't necessarily have the personnel to cover them like you would have with Adoree and Fabian Moreau. Um, so there's that, but also you don't have good linebackers. Micah McFadden, I talked about earlier in the show, he's not necessarily a run-stuffing linebacker. He can make plays, but he really cannot disengage blocks. Jalen Smith, the last few games, has gotten blown up uh, trying to disengage blocks. I mean, he's really taken out of the picture. Tay Crowder has never really been that guy. Um, which makes me wonder a lot of different things. What is Wink's plan? What is you know the Giants' plan overall to try to make that better? Because you can't keep allowing 200 yards per game on the ground. Uh, whether it's 4.3 yards per carry, 3.8, whatever, that's still a lot of yardage to allow. And teams will find that and say, okay, well, listen, uh, we got a two-back set of Robinson and uh, Antonio Gibson. We're going to destroy you guys. That's going to be our game plan. Uh, while we have some receivers that you should respect. I mean, Curtis Samuel, at least to my knowledge, hasn't been injured. He's had a really good year. Uh, Terry McLaurin's doing Terry McLaurin things. I know that's focusing on next week, but you got to find some sort of a plan. You have to do something, whether it's making Julian Love a part of the box again, whether it's recalling Landon Collins. I mean, in my personal opinion, and I know we brought Collins on, and we were all so excited he played against the, uh, the Jags. He also played against... Uh, the Seahawks as well, is, you know, why not test it out at this point? Why not? I don't know if there's a cap thing there. How worse can Landon Collins be uh, than Jalen Smith and Tay Crowder and Michael McFadden? And I'm not saying totally throw shit at the wall and see what sticks, but see what you have. See what you have. Because you cannot keep having teams run down your throat up the fucking gut. Because Leonard Williams... And um, Dexter Lawrence will keep getting double teamed. Jelly Ellis is Danny Shelton of this year. I'm sorry. He really has made no impact. Um, I would honestly take either Mondo or Ellis off the roster, but Ryder Anderson necessarily isn't a – he's not a defensive tackle. He's more of a defensive interior. So like the Mondo position, maybe he's better suited there. Uh, I would call him up because we have five guys that play the defensive line position. You have Ward, you have Mondo, you have Ellis, you have Lawrence, and you have Leonard Williams. So figure out there, obviously Nick Williams, in my opinion, was a big loss. Same thing with DJ Davidson because at least they were showing some results. Uh, You're not really seeing the same thing with Jelly Ellis. Um, And then Henry Mondo is, you know, on occasion he'll make a good play, but you're not really relying on it. And also the fact that you really have no depth at that position, which causes... Well, when Dexter Lawrence comes off the field, uh, you got to put Jelly Ellis or Mondo in. And it also causes something else as well, where the Giants are absolutely afraid to take both off the field at the same time. You saw many reps against the Cowboys where they're playing Mondo and they're playing Ellis and they're also playing Dexter Lawrence. And then they switch them out with Leonard Williams. So once again, it tells the tale that they're really scared of this defensive line depth. But 
putting a Ryder Anderson in who was pretty solid. Um, I think he played against the Jags, and I think he also played against the Ravens too. I thought he had two solid games. You know, he made some plays. So you got to figure out something to solve this run defense issue over the next few weeks because it's not going to get any easier. It really isn't. Uh, Dalvin Cook, the two-headed monster of Gibson and, uh, and Brian Robinson. The Colts have a monster running game with Jonathan Taylor. Um, and that's pretty much down the stretch, right? Also, you got Jalen Hurts as a running quarterback. You have um, Miles Sanders, who's a bigger back. Boston Scott, who always kills us. So there's that. There's that. Um, Shout-outs to Julian Love and Rodarius Williams with the two interceptions. I also thought Nick McLeod held up well. He did give up the touchdown to Dalton Schultz, which is something, once again, you can't be happy about. Um, but I thought they played well, and it shows – that in this situation, sometimes, yeah, these guys should not be on an NFL field. They shouldn't be starting for the New York Giants. But I think you could make some serious, real serious consideration uh, for McLeod and Radarius to be depth pieces long term. Aaron Robinson is such a question mark at this point with the injuries and with the way he was playing in the preseason. There's that. Um, Cordell Flott, Jason Pinnock, and Darnay Holmes struggled. But going back on my point, Darius Williams can play the slot. He could play the outside. Same thing with Nick McLeod. So if you were healthy 100%, and let's just say in you know other terms, this game was a test game of some sorts, right? You could say, okay, listen, when we're fully healthy, a Dory and Fabian could be the corners and switch with Darius and uh, Nick McLeod out. Those guys can play man coverage. Um, Jason Pinnock had a horrible day. He was not a fine tackler, which we really have looked for uh, in this defense, and he just didn't play well. He was covering tight ends. He wasn't very good um, against Dalton Schultz. Darnay Holmes, I mean, he was getting busted from the slot, but I've said this, and there was a really bad holding penalty on him where he barely even fucking touched the guy. He barely even touched CeeDee Lamb, but the white, the white rhinoceros, also known as Scott Novak, the head official, decided to call it. I mean, they obviously want to push things in the Cowboys' favor. But I'm not going to start that argument because the Giants made too many of their own mistakes to even talk about the referees as a factor in this game. Um, but Darnay Holmes, man, this has been the thing with him the last few years. But it's really getting uh, recognized right now. Teams earlier in the year did not throw to him because, well, you know, it just really wasn't sticking as a part of their game plan. They more focused on the run or whatever. But now, I think the Cowboys officially made, um, you know, the thing out there, right? They they pulled out the card saying, look, Darnay Holmes is very vulnerable in man coverage. Um, I've known this. I've known this for a while. Obviously, in Patrick Graham's defense, they never ran a ton of man. They ran zone, and that's where he fit. But you look at his man coverage in training camp when he was one-on-one -on -one against Richie James, let me tell you something, even though he had some turnovers, he was not looking good. Um, Cordell Flott, he struggles to tackle. He's not great in coverage. He struggled. He struggled. Um, and he's concussed now, so you wonder the development of him. Where's that going to go? You move on to the next round. Dane Belton did not play much. So the Giants are dealing with a ton of adversity. And I think these next few weeks whether you're talking rebuild or playoff expectations it's going to be a uh, it's going to be a test for the coaching staff to see with pieces in and out of the lineup how are they willing to adjust how are they willing to adjust but that's the end of that let's talk about stock up stock down and snap count as well so stock up Nick Gates probably deserves stock up in this game. Uh, Darius Slayton didn't have too many drops. I'll put him on the board. Darius Williams, Nick McLeod. Kayvon Thibodeau definitely deserves a stock up in this game. Offensively, other than, you know, Slayton, I'd probably say Myrick, but that's not saying a ton. Uh, as far as stock down goes, Daniel Jones really didn't move the needle for me. Um, Saquon Barkley, the linebackers again. Justin Ellis, if you even consider him a, a part. Henry Mondo, Jack Anderson, Mark Lewinsky, Andrew Thomas, Tyree Phillips, Cordell Flott, Dorney Holmes, Jason Pinnock. Just a, just a ton of bad, but at the same time, you kind of expected this, right? And one more thing before I go into the snap counts we'll finish off is people are criticizing Wink for this game, and I may have mentioned it in the beginning. 
But I'll mention it now again. And that is, people are criticizing him. Oh, failure to adjust this, 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 this. Maybe it was one or two plays where he shouldn't have sent too much pressure. But at the same time, he plays zone, and he did play zone sometimes. He played off man coverage as well. Which, honestly, I don't have an issue. I really didn't have an issue with the defensive game plan. Just the execution overall. Um, What did you want him to do? Because I said this in the preview. People are going to be mad if he goes out and throws zone coverage. And say, oh, this is soft zone. This is Patrick Graham. But then, um, if he were to throw out, throw out a man coverage type defense like he usually does, people would be mad at him. So, I think people are just mad. They're irrational. Obviously, coming off a game like this, you don't want to uh, be corrected in your thoughts. But you just got to shift that and go towards you know making more rational points. And fans are fans. I'm not going to tell anybody how to fan, but obviously we got to focus on next week with, uh, with the coming opponent of the Washington Commanders football team, whatever the fuck you want to call them. Um, but let's look at snap counts. Jack Anderson, Mark Lewinsky, Nick Gates, uh, Tyree Phillips. Basically the whole line, and Daniel Jones played 100% of the snaps. Gary Slayton, 84%. Barkley, 73%. 70% for Isaiah Hodgins and Rich James. Lawrence Cager, 44%. 36% for Chris Myrick, 30% for Kenny Galladay, 28% for Matt Breida, 22% for Tanner Hudson, 17% for Gary Brightwell. Uh, they included the extra tackle on some plays, Corey Cunningham, 12%, and then Marcus Johnson, uh, 11%. Then you take a look at the defensive snaps. Jason Pinnock, Nick McLeod, and Julian Love played 100% of the snaps, 91% for Jalen Smith, 84% for Leonard Williams and Dexter Lawrence, 73% for Tibbs, 67% for Radarius Williams, 64% for Jihad Ward and Micah McFadden, 60% for O'Shane Zimenez, 53% for Cordell Flott, 48% for Henry Mondo, 43% for Darnie Holmes, 28% for Timon Fox, 23% for Justin Ellis, um, 9% for Dane Belton, 8% for Tay Crowder, and 1% for Ellison Smith. I honestly just don't get why he's on the team. And, you know... We could turn this argument into several different branches of, you know, where could you put the extra man. I just don't know why Ellison Smith is on this team. And we've talked for weeks, you know, even going back to the Dory injury ever before that. Like, this guy's not of use. Um, there's really no development at this point if you're playing him 1% of the snaps and if you're playing Timon Fox over him. Um, and he's a fourth-round pick, so I don't know how much he would cost. But you might as well just make him... A fucking healthy scratch every week. Um, obviously, they cut Quincy Roche. It's not something I'm bothered by. They don't like him. It was just a depth thing. They also waived Hamilton, uh, Devery Hamilton, that is, and um, Trenton Thompson. But they'll be back on the practice squad. So we'll see where that goes. Um, but, yeah, that's that. Like, comment, and subscribe. Turn on post notifications so you know when the live stream pops up your drops. Appreciate y'all coming back. No podcast out on Tuesday. Uh, obviously this would be the podcast on Tuesday, but you know, I'm not waiting till Tuesday. Want to get it out, you know, and the feelings and reactions and stuff like that. Um, and then, uh, Saturday we'll have the, uh, preview pod, not this coming Saturday. Um, uh, not, I should say the Saturday this premieres on, there's no two episodes in one, but, um, the third we'll have the preview for the commanders. I'll probably get somebody on and, uh, we'll talk about that. Appreciate you guys. We're seven and four. We'll see where this goes. Let's go Giants. Peace out, everybody. Hope you all had a happy Thanksgiving and peace out.